Yeah, uh, thank you for the introduction, Mr. Chairman. Uh, sad to say, but I'm not a doctor, just not yet. Um, yeah, uh, good day to you all in the audience. As it was mentioned, my name is Marzia de Roque, uh, and today I'm going to present you a case report about pseudocowpox virus and dairy farms in Slovenia. Uh, it is actually the first reported case of this virus in Slovenia, uh, where also the molecular methods uh, were done to determine this virus. Mm, this survey was uh, done together with uh, the colleagues from the veterinary faculty. Um, and uh, yeah, first of all, I don't think that a lot of you knows uh, where Slovenia is, so maybe I would tell you a little bit about that at the beginning. Uh, it, is, it lies in the Central Europe, uh, in, in between Austria, Italy, Hungary, and, and Croatia, uh, with a population around 2 million people. Uh, that is somehow the same at, as uh, there is a population in, in Sapporo. So we are a small country. Uh, you can see there a Lake Bled, one of the most popular tourist sites in Slovenia. Uh, otherwise, we have a continental climate. That means that the weather is quite good also for raising cattle. Uh, in Slovenia, we have around half a million uh, cattle that are raised on 32,000 farms. That means uh, that the average uh, uh, farm are a little, have a little bit less than 15 head per farm. So we can see that we have only small family farms. Um, and around 3,500 of them, it's also in the uh, national milk control. On the other hand, I work as a practitioner on the biggest dairy farms in Slovenia. Uh, we own or we have around 800 milking cows, Holstein Frisian breed, and we are located down south of the country. Uh, all these cattle are separated in, are, uh, on three farms that, that are nearby. Uh, and yeah, we are also the biggest producer of milk in Slovenia, uh, with a little bit more than 7 million liters of milk sold per year. Uh, and down here, I would, start, uh, I would start my case report. This is a stable for, for our young cows, uh, where all the cows are gathered, of course, from all three farms uh, in, the few, uh, in the first days of their life. Uh, in my few years, in my, in my years uh, of work here, I, was found, I found a sporadic occurrence of some pustular lesions on muzzle, nostrils, and oral mucosa, uh, mostly in calves up to first months of age. You can see here the changes on the muzzle, on the heart palate, and on, on the gingivas. Uh, all of these uh, changes could be found throughout the year, uh, but the majority of these changes were found uh, in the winter time in periods with higher density of housing uh, due to a higher number of calvings. And of course, all were found in calves that were suffering from severe and long-lasting diarrhea. Uh, so this somehow points out that there must be some immunosuppression present, uh, and then uh, these changes occurs. But yeah, like, uh, but there were never, the prevalence was never higher than 5%. Because I wanted to know what was the cause of, this, uh, of these uh, changes. I have taken skin scrapings of pebbles and swaps from erosions uh, from two calves with most severe and obvious lesions. Uh, I transferred then uh, this sampled material to, to the lab where it was inoculated on bovine turbinal cell culture where it caused cytopathic effect. Uh, we have done, or in the lab, there was done also an electronic microscopy uh, and the parapox virus has been identified. So somehow this is how we know that the parapox virus is the one that was causing our troubles or the, the, the changes in our calves. Uh, for the parapox virus, um, we know that it comes from a family of pox viride. Uh, they're oval shaped, relatively large, double-stranded DNA viruses, enveloped and with a helical structure. In this uh, genus, uh, we know four different species or virus that is mostly uh, known in, in sheep and goat, parapox virus of red deer in New Zealand, and then the last two that are common for cattle, uh, they are bovine papular stomatitis virus and pseudocowpox virus. Uh, they are all epiteliotropic. That means that uh, infection normally occurs through scarified or damaged skin, then followed by virus replication in epidermal keratinocytes. 
Uh, the virus is highly resistant in the environment and the carriers are normally uh, infected animals and contaminated objects. Uh, because we wanted to know which species is causing uh, uh, the changes, we have done the PCR with primers targeting OR45 gene. Um, this this uh, uh, gene was used because uh, it was also used in some previous um, in some previous determination of parapox viruses, even though the preferred gene for sequence analysis is B2L gene, and all the latest uh, um, researchers are doing this gene. Anyway, uh, there were some um, some data to compare to uh, in gene bank, and uh, we found that 97 to 99 percent similarity. Uh, of our virus with, uh, pseudo other pse with pseudocarpox virus and lower homology with other parapox viruses. So in this case, we somehow said, okay, we have pseudocarpox virus that is causing uh, uh, our changes. But uh, in the literature, uh, pseudocarpox virus is more often associated with lesions on the other and skin of dairy cows. Uh, because of its, uh -huh, and of course, when we find out uh, what was the, the pathogen, I went also and checked uh, what is happening to our cows. And you can see here some of the pictures uh, of the changes on the tits of the cows also. Um, this virus has a zoonotic character. It normally affects milkers. It can affect also other personnel that is in contact uh, with affected animals. It is so-called milkers nodule. Uh, and the changes can occur also in, in, in workers, uh, mostly on the hands, on the skin, on the hands, and, but it can, uh, it can happen also on, on other parts. The virus has a short-term immunity, so cattle may become reinfected. So that means that normally when the disease enters or when the disease is in the herd, uh, that uh, it will stay there. Um, now, what can we do to prevent it or to minimize the, the spread? Uh, systematic wear of gloves and working clothes is important. Also, avoid group housing of calves and use of shared feeding, either buckets or tits when we have a uh, cow-calf situation. Uh, good milking parlor hygiene is important. Tea dipping, disinfection of milking units also. But I think that these are just some basic uh, measures that are probably already done on, on a lot of farms. So there is nothing special uh, that can be done uh, according to, to that. Now, uh, in conclusion, I have to say that this virus is often underestimated or even overlooked. Uh, and this is how it also was in our case. And when I was talking to a lot of other veterinarians in my country, there was just a minority that really know or have ever seen this, these changes. But the majority said that they were they never seen this and, and they were never called upon the farm uh, about uh, or because of these changes. Uh, and this is probably um, because of uh, frequent benign resolution and low economic importance. Even though some literature are saying that they had uh, quite a lot of problems because of this virus, I can say for our case that uh, in our uh, calves, uh, all these changes uh, uh, healed for themselves. Uh, in 14 to, to days to one month, um, and also the cows didn't have the cows didn't have any problems with suckling, with with uh, gain. Uh, they were normally gaining uh, their weight and so on. So there was no no problems with the cows, and this is also the same with cows. Uh, we didn't correlate these changes on the tits with uh, I don't know any. A more mastitis incidents or, uh, or I don't know, that the cows would kick the milking units off or something like that. So we didn't find any, any uh, problems according to this, to this virus. Um, yeah, we have to take care about zoonotic potential. We shouldn't forget about it. Uh, but I cannot correlate uh, the virus to some, to some skin changes in our workers uh, in the past time. Um, but of course, now as we know what is happening, what is the, the cause, uh, we will definitely um, take some samples uh, and to try to, to figure out if the changes that will occur in, in, in human or in workers uh, could be um, uh, connected to, to the virus. 
But like I said, for the past, yeah, there were some uh, reports, but it's a problem uh, because they also resolved for themselves. I didn't say anything about uh, differential diagnosis, but uh, of course, when, when seeing the, the changes in cows, we have to uh, take in consideration foot and mouth disease, vesicular stomatitis, uh, but luckily in our region, we don't have these diseases, so maybe also because of that, this virus or these changes are overlooked. Uh, when we are talking about, uh, about cows, herpes mammillitis uh, needs to be considered and papillomatosis also. Now, uh, at the end, um, all the literature said that, says that uh, the, the uh, clinical signs or, uh, uh, were found almost all over the world. So that means that probably the virus is spread all, all, over, all over the world. But uh, in the last years, there are just not so many researches uh, done about that. And all the researches that were done are mostly connected to the countries where they still have foot and mouth disease present. So, uh, my agenda to you today, or why I wanted to present this to you, is that uh, next time that you will be in, in your herds, uh, please pay attention to these possible changes, record them, maybe take some samples and try to figure it out. Either it's the same virus that is causing uh, the problems, or I don't know, it's something else. So this would be, from my point, everything. Thank you very much. <laughs>